Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours for September post cloud post post cloud post cloud world Office Hours. It's a good start when I can't even get the sentences out. Uh, I must apologize. Yeah, the energy levels will probably be a bit down tonight. Um, it's the, the jet lag has kicked in. Uh, not much sleep this week, but uh, hopefully we'll get through it. So uh, no guarantees the slides will work. No guarantees the demos will work. Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll do our best to charge on regardless. Um, as always, sing out in the chat line if you can't hear me or see me properly. Um, if someone can just throw something in the chat, just to make sure that everyone can actually chat. I think that's already been done, but just to double check. Throw some, anyone, anyone on the chat line? Anybody? Anybody? Someone on the Q&A line? Good enough. There we go. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks all. That's all I need to know. Otherwise, I always feel bad 20 minutes in, you know, someone sends me a Twitter DM saying, I wouldn't mind asking a damn question. So, um, yeah, so apologies for that. But we're all good to go. Cool. Let me share my screen. As always, uh, getting in touch with me is easy. My Twitter DMs are always open at Connor and CD. Uh, if you want to get in touch with all the other social media platforms that have become the thing nowadays, uh, including the um, you know, the giant sewer pit that is uh, that used to be Twitter, uh, you can go to Linktree slash Connor or scan the QR code. It will work even with my ugly mug in the middle of it. Uh, that'll take you to that Linktree page, which has all my things like blog, GitHub repo, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So any way you want to get in touch with me, you can go through over there. So um, as I always say, uh, for anyone that's new on the office hours, do not adjust your set. The slide content always appears sort of a little bit skew if it's uh, off to the left or down below. Uh, that's because we turn this into a video later on and we put my, my face somewhere else in the video. Uh, nothing more frustrating than having content blurred by the webinar host. So we try to shift the uh, content around and the code around such that it doesn't get interfered with. As always, I like to do a few bits and pieces, mainly, I say bits and pieces, really it's just a promotion for a passion of mine, which is user groups, uh, because I always like to see user groups prosper. So a couple of internal things first, um, if you haven't noticed, you can now get 23AI, you can download it for free, run it um, basically on your own um, systems now. Uh, just this week, we also uh, released the ARM architecture version. So if you're a Mac user and you're sick and tired of using a container inside Kalima or something like that, then yeah, yeah a little bit more of a, a native port now. So you can download the ARM version uh, to run on your Macs. You can get it on our cloud-based service. You can also get a, a autonomous now free version as well. So you can run autonomous on 23AI. And if you're an Exadata person or an ODA person, I did a, a webinar for the ODA people in Asia recently, you can now run 23AI on your engineered systems as well. And of course, there were some big announcements at Cloud World. And as you'd imagine, I was pretty much like everyone else uh, waiting for Cloud World, thinking we know what's going to come on Cloud World because people were saying there was going to be a big announcement and I was all excited and what did that happen? It turned out to be an announcement that we're now partnering with AWS, which don't get me wrong, is a big deal because let's face it, everyone's running their clouds on Oracle, Azure, Google and AWS. So multi-cloud across all those things is super cool. But this is what wasn't announced, um, which was a bummer. Uh, please don't hate me, not my fault. Um, I don't travel in the circles uh, in the organization that make these decisions. So um, I, I would love to say that I know the date we're gonna release the on-prem generally, and I'm not telling you, you know, to have some sort of power trip, but uh, no, that's not actually true. I have no clue. Um, th that one sits literally, I think as far as I know, solely with Safra and Larry Ellison. And um, rest assured, it's fair to say, you know, it's not like, Larry Ellison is phoning me going, hey, Connor, I just need your advice for when we should um, when we should release it. And I'm going, no, 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 I'm too busy making office hours. Uh, no, rest assured, I don't know when it's coming out. Hopefully soon I'm itching to use it as much as, a, as I'm sure you are. One last thing on Cloud World. Um, I sat at the database booth for a number of hours there and people were just coming around all the time and just saying hello, just chewing the fat, talking 23AI, but all sorts of other things as well. Um, so yeah, so if you're in Cloud World and you're back in town, um, you know, watching this office hours, thanks for coming and saying hi. Um, I had a blast of a time. And if you came to any of my sessions, I hope you enjoyed them as well. Uh, one of our office hours questions actually is about my session tonight. So we'll see how we go. We have a chat line here. <laughs> okay, Francois saying he no longer hates me. Okay, well, that's right. Uh, if you do hate me, grab a ticket and get in line, I say. So 
A um, couple of quick announcements. Uh, this one has now been out for a few months, but please uh, check out SQL Developer for VS Code. It's probably where we're going. Let's face it, VS Code is the IDE um, it's sort of around the world for almost all developers. So SQL Developer, the full-blown Java version, continues to exist, but I would say it's, it's the number of features that come into that platform will no longer be as dramatic and as fast as they come into uh, the VS Code. Uh, it's just an extension, so it's great. You fire up VS Code, the extensions update, and you just pick up new versions as you go. Uh, check it out. If you did go to Cloud World or if you didn't go to Cloud World, um, one of the things that I've always tried to do at the end of Cloud World is put together a shell script that lets you download every single presentation because uh, by default, um, using the, the, the website, you go into each session, click on a session, and then you can download just that session. And there's over a thousand sessions at Cloud World, and you know, some people just want to dump of everything. So I've been sifting through the JSON weeds in the website, because it's all done with REST and everything, to come up with all the sessions, all the um, uploaded presentation files, and um, I'll post that, put that blog post out in a couple of days, um, once I just make sure it's, it's all working as I expected. One thing I will note is at the moment, uh, any access to session presentations is uh, single sign-on only, which means you have to be have been an attendee, I think, at Cloud World. Um, so what you could probably do is sign up for maybe the digital sessions, which I think was free. But either way, um, the web page I've got up there will talk you through how to assign, um, single sign-on in, uh, grab some cookies because you need that cookie in order to actually go download the files. But blog post coming in a couple of days, and hopefully if you were at Cloud World or at least were a virtual attendee, you'll be able to grab all the session content. A couple of things coming up for me. I've got a very, very hectic October coming up. First, I'll be in Poland at the Poland Oracle User Group. Wonderful event there. Uh, I say small scale, that's not trying to be rude. Basically, it's great the organizers have chosen that, yep, we're going to have a few hundred people, a couple hundred people, and that's our sweet spot. They don't try grow here. They say, we're going to have the same number of sessions, same number of tracks, and yet it's always a great event. Then I'll be popping down to Austria for an event there, and then I'll be off to the Netherlands for an event there, and then to Croatia for an event there, and then to Spain for an event there, and finally at Denmark. All that is in one trip. Um, don't get me wrong, I realize how fortunate I am to um, actually get to these events. But yeah, if you're any of these places in Europe, if you're joining us from Europe tonight, please pop in and say hi. Um, I'd love to chew the fat. Almost all my talks and these things will be regarding 23AI and other similar related topics. And luckily, just a couple of weeks ago, I got approval to go to the annual DOAG conference in Nuremberg. Uh, that's on a different scale to the ones I've just mentioned. The other ones are sort of smaller user group meetups. This one's normally one to 2,000 people, huge event. Um, there'll be a stack of Oracle people there and a stack of ACE directors as well there. So that'll be a fantastic event. Uh, if you're anywhere in Germany, uh, get along to the DOAG conference. That's a, an amazing event. All that, of course, comes to the one thing, which is me, as always, every month at about, what, at slide 21, I say, support your local user groups. Um, myself, in fact, my friend Jeffrey's on the call. Uh, we've got an um, OZUG um, user group, Australian user group. Uh, we'll be running a small scale event probably in Perth later on this year. So if you're in Australia, uh, there'll be an event, I think, in Perth and probably something similar in Melbourne. So uh, yeah, get along, support your local user groups and build better communities. So what are we talking about tonight? Uh, we're going to talk about vectors and AI and 23C AI stuff. This, the first one is about a question that I got asked many, many times uh, at Cloud World, which we'll come to. Um, then I had a question about the demo we did at Cloud World. Someone's saying, how did you do the demo? And we'll talk about that. Um, some new Apex export options, uh, the concept of what I call too much parallel, and that'll I'll explain that shortly. Um, how to pass arguments into SQL CL or SQL Plus um, the scripts. Uh, a problem with a partition table getting excessively large and uh, peel SQL parameter errors, which I I think I wrote that in the notes, but I don't think I've actually got any slides for it. Um, if, if we actually finish all this stuff in time, I'll just have to verbally talk about through that and we'll um, and we maybe get around to doing um, a demo or something next month because yeah, I put that in there. As you can see, the jet lag has already taken effect. So let's get into it. As always, um, sing out on the chat line um, if you have any questions. Oh, I've got a... Um, what have we got? Something in the Q&A as well. Um, ping chat, oh, that's saying, oh, that's, that's, sorry, that's me not understanding Q&A. You've got to dismiss it, otherwise it says it's still there. Cool. This is why I prefer the chat as opposed to Q&A. I know others may differ. Oh, the chat line's popping up. Okay, Francois is asking, how to install SQL Dev on VS Code 
uh, that has no internet access at a customer that blocks access to the internet. Um, I'm not entirely sure what a MOBO means, sorry, that's maybe my jet lag. Um, what I would be in a machine, okay, there we go. Um, that's something I, I never knew. What I'd be inclined to do is VS Code can sit pretty much in a portable directory. So if that was the case, I'd be inclined to install VS Code on a local machine in a portable directory in portable fashion, install the various extensions you need, and then simply pick up that entire directory and head off to the customer. Um, and you could do it that way. Um, that's not ideal, obviously, because you want your extensions to regularly update and VS Code itself wants to regularly update for improved you know, facilities and bug fixes. But worst case scenario, you could do it in a portable fashion along those lines. Okay, what are we talking about? Vectors and AI. Uh, this this is someone that basically um, obviously came to Cloudflare. I'm, I, I'm not sure if they actually spoke to me, but this was a very common question that came out from a number of people at Cloudworld just in interactions, which is, we sent a team of people to Cloudworld, and as we expected, there was so much talk about artificial intelligence, you know, natural language to your database, interfacing with ChatGT and other, you know, LLMs, etc. And they said, none of that we'd expect to use, certainly on day one. So is there any benefit for us with all this vector technology that was coming up? Now, not just being an Oracle person, but there's an obvious answer that you're expecting from me, which is I'm going to say yes, and but I want to justify that. And this is an interesting one is that with all the cool stuff about AI in terms of you may have seen the select AI demos where someone simply types in, you know, what were the sales for last year and we work out what the SQL would be. Or if you've seen any of the new features in the latest Apex release, you would have seen the ability to use natural language to build pages, build applications, you know, get um, ideas on SQL text, etc. A lot of cool stuff in terms of natural language, or which is, you know, that sort of, it almost seems like magic. But I think a lot of people are expecting that, well, when they move to 23AI, maybe they're not going to make that leap, especially where that's that concept of privacy and, and what parts of the AI will need to talk out to external parties like chat, GTP, etc., etc. I'm going to get chat and GTP right once at least this, uh, <laughs> this session. So the question is, if we're not going to do that, is there still any benefits from all these new vector sort of um, new features that are coming in 23AI? And I would say yes. And the probably the most common one will be in the area of search. And to do that, I thought we'd just do a little quick demo of what a vector is and then show you hopefully how I think literally on day one, you could implement this just this one feature and have enormous um, happiness from your customers who are using your systems. So let's flick over to a demo. So in its simplest form, a vector, for those, for those that aren't familiar with all these new data types coming in 23AI, a vector is a very fancy way of saying an array. It's just a list of numbers, like that's it. So there's a new vector function in 23AI. You can notice I didn't have to do from jewel there. That's another 23AI feature. But I can do select vector of, I want two dimensions or two elements in this array. So zero comma zero. If you're familiar with sort of high school you know, geometry, that would be the origin. I can have, you know, 10 comma zero, et cetera. I can have zero comma five and other parameters that go into this vector function. Uh, the second parameter is the number of dimensions and this one's got two. And the third parameter is I can nominate what the data types of each of the elements will be. Typically when we get into machine learning models and all this more sophisticated stuff, uh, the most common things you see in vector dimensions is floating point numbers um, because their origins aren't necessarily in databases. They're more in mathematical and uh, machine learning models. Here's an example of a vector with, let me count them up, uh, seven, seven dimensions, 431, 7432. And you can see by default, it's been, they've, each one's been stored as a floating point number. So you can think of a vector as being a single column, a single element that actually contains multiple numerics. So it's basically an array of numbers. A key element when it comes to vectors is the content of what we call vector distance. Now I'm doing a very simple example here. I'm just using two dimensions so we can use our familiar high school mathematics. We've got the x-axis on the horizontal and the y-axis going up. And I've drawn two vectors here in a line between them. So one vector you can see there is one comma one and the other vector is three comma one. And you know, it's not rocket science to work out that the distance between those two vectors is two. And as you expect, that's exactly what we get back from the database. We're saying the distance between vector 1, 1, which is this one here, and vector 3, 1, which is this one here, is simply two points. We get this 2e. Once again, because it's all floating points, we get the result as a floating point number. I could convert it to a number to see that the distance is 2. So that's hardly profound. We can see what's going on here. Effectively, a 
vector distance is the distance between two points. In two dimensions, it's easy. In three dimensions, it's just the same logic, effectively just you know x squared, y squared, z squared. In four dimensions, it's w squared, x squared, y squared, z squared, et cetera, et cetera. There are plenty of algorithms out there, uh, which we can talk about maybe on another office hours, about calculating different kinds of distances between vectors, but the concept is the same. We need to know the distance between them. The significance of why distance is important will come up shortly. So here's one other example, uh, just using once again our high school geometry, we've got one, one horizontal, one vertical, and the difference would be the square root of two for those that remember their Pythagorean sort of stuff. So we got vectors and we have this thing called vector distance. Let's bring it together with perhaps what I think is a real life example, which I think will be the thing that people use when they go to 23AI, even if they never touch all the cool whiz bang AI stuff. So I've populated the table called trivia with a whole stack of facts. I'll fly, there's a result and you, there's a whole stack of them in there. There's about 330. Let's just grab a random set that I know are sort of nicely divided up so I can show you what's actually in there. I've got some, some trivia about cities in the USA. I've got some trivia about motor vehicles. I've got some trivia about fruit. I've got some trivia about cats and dogs. And I've got some trivia about drinks, popular cocktails. So it's just random stuff that's in this table. Let's assume that is some free text or anything that's a real life table in your application. And I wanna provide ad hoc search on that table. I wanna let people do searching for stuff in it. So let's do, for example, this query, which is, there's that little question for you. Can people see that little annotation thing on the video or not? Little arrow at the bottom left corner? Yes, no, hopefully no. Otherwise, it's being recorded. Yeah, we'll see how we go. No, thank, thanks, Jeff. Cool. I was just right there because there's a big arrow in my Zoom thing saying I can draw on my screen, but I don't, want to, I don't want it caught in the recording. So I've got my trivia table and I'm going to do a simple search. And, and we know in advance that there's some drinks about, you know, some drink recipes in there. And we're looking, someone comes on as an ad hoc user. So I'm looking for some information about cocktails. And unfortunately, even though there's information about cocktails in that table, the word cocktail never appears. So we've got things like, on you can see the last four lines, we've got a Caprahina or a French 75, a Cuba Libre, all these random cocktails in there, but the word cocktail never appears. So an ad hoc search for cocktail returns nothing. And this is a really common problem in ad hoc search. We know the semantic meaning of cocktail is similar to the list of drink recipes. A cocktail is a recipe of drink ingredients. So that's a semantic meaning, but in terms of pure text, there's nothing there. Let's go back to our. However, when it comes to vectors and machine learning models, what we can do is we can exploit or we can gain access to the concept of semantic meaning, not just text based matching. So to do so, I'm going to create a directory here on my server called home Oracle models. Really, all that matters there is we've provided in 23AI a number of what we call machine learning models that have basically been trained on vast amounts of data. It might be text, they might have been trained on images, on audio. There are lots of models out there designed through specific things. This particular one here, this all mini LLM, L6 V2, is about doing text and sentences and understanding English language. So I've loaded it into my database. So someone out there in, in machine learning land, you know, burnt dozens of hours of CPUs with lots of GPUs going through swathes and swathes of data to come up with this model. And this model has an understanding of how to process English language and understand the meaning behind English language. So what it's take, taken is effectively an ability to map English language to vectors, but not just like we did where we just construct vectors with random numbers. It can actually construct vectors where the distance between vectors represents the similarity in terms of semantics. So, and we'll continue and have a look. So I've loaded this model into my database. The key thing here is the database hasn't has to do that work. It's not like we're number crunching away in the database, building these extravagant models because that takes a lot of compute time. It's not a smart use of your database investment. But what I can do now is I can say using this model I just created, which is a model that's been trained on English language and semantic meaning, go get all the facts from my table, all those pieces of trivia about drinks and dogs and cats and cars and cities in America, and create a vector for each one of those pieces of text. So if I look at it, you can see for each one of my facts now, using this machine learning model that has been trained on English language, it has created a vector. 
Now, this is truncated here. Each of these vectors is actually about 768 dimensions. I've just shown the first few here. But every single sentence here has been passed through this machine learning model and converted to a vector representation. You can think of it, it's almost like um, WinZip for text. I can take all this text and end up with just a compact set of numbers as dimensions. Now, I can also do the same thing with that piece of phrase, that search text that came in from a user. Someone's looking for cocktails. Once again, I've just shown the first little bit here, just to show you actually what it really is. If I take out the truncation, you can see it's actually, oh, I actually turned my long to too long. It's actually, these are the first, I think, four lines here. It actually goes for many, many, many lines. It's some um, 700 dimensions, bug in the script. But now this concept of vector distance comes into play. I've got all these pieces of uh, useless information here, each of which maps to a vector. I've got this search term called cocktail, which also maps to a vector. The closeness of this vector to the vectors in this table determines the similarity of the word cocktail to the semantic meaning of this text. So just by doing vector distance comparisons between these vectors, I can work out which of these rows has a meaning similar to cocktail. And just to prove it to you, I'm now going to query from my trivia table, which now has vectors as well. I'm ordering by the vector distance. That is the existing vectors from this table that we saw up here with the vector embedding for cocktail, which is this one we see above here. Because I'm ordering by distance, the closest distance comes out first. And you can see out of those random facts, the rows that have the vectors closest to the vector for cocktail happen to be martini, margarita, espresso martini, and dark and stormy. Hopefully immediately you can see the awesome benefit this has in terms of ad hoc search. Someone came in and searched for cocktail and they got some cocktails back even though the word cocktail never ever appeared. And it works across the board. So if I search for greyhounds, I get some of the rows that pertain to dogs and guess what? Greyhound was the very first one, but it also found some other ones as well. These were close in terms of vector distance from the, um, the search term of greyhound. Same thing with Suzuki. Once again, I get cars. There's no Suzuki in any of my rows here. There were no Suzuki rows at all in the table, but it knows that Suzuki is related to cars, car models, and it has that semantic meaning. And I think that was the last one I had. Got something in the chat. <laughs> Row num less than or equal to 10. How outdated. Yeah, I'm going I'm to kick you off this call, Francois. <laughs> Row num's, Row num, in fact, um, no, I don't have it tonight. I'll have you know that in 23AI, Ronum gets used more than it used to. That's a little teaser uh, for a future office hours, which you might get to. Oh, we got something in the Q&A. So Hermat's saying, so the vector distance function is executed in line for every row on TriggerVet when the search query is executed. Um, that is correct, simply because there are no indexes on this table. Uh, one of the things you can do, which we won't talk about tonight, is you can create vector indexes as well. Basically, uh, similar to a normal index in the fact that it's a secondary structure that speeds up the process of hunting through vector indexes. Because you're exactly right, um, that would effectively be doing a vector distance calculation for every single row, which obviously is expensive. Um, in the same way that a table scan can be expensive, so we use indexes to narrow down the set. Same thing with a vector index, we use vector indexes to narrow down the set before we do the distance calculations. There we go. And you are saying, uh, using FETs first does in fact mean everything is similar, just things are more similar. Correct. Okay, let's do that. What are people doing in the Q&A? Stay in the chat, folks. Stay in the chat. Now, that first example was trivial. It was just, I got you know these little short sentences that I convert to vectors, and then I want to do an ad hoc search. What if I want to handle some documents? So um, hopefully you can still see there. This is the exact same list of trivia, but it's just stored in a single PDF document. So I've now got the exact same 360 rows, but it's just one single PDF document that hopefully you can see popped up there. Now, I don't want to basically create a single vector for that entire document. That makes no sense. What I'm looking for is bits and pieces inside the documents. And what we've done is we've created facilities in 23AI to let you do that as well. So even if you've got large chunks of unstructured data, you can still do vector searches in between, you know, inside them. So in this case, I've taken this trivia PDF, which we just saw on screen, and I've loaded it in as a blob into a table, and you can see it's about 61K in size, but I wanna hunt down into the text inside it. So we've added these new facilities. One is we can DBMS vector chain. It says, convert this blob to text. And you can see when I run that, 
I've now extracted the text from my PDF. It's no longer a PDF, but it is still just a single thing. It's a single club field with all the text in it. Once again, I want to dig into that to actually do vector searches on individual elements. So I've got this thing called UTL to chunks. I can convert this large blob now into chunks of text. And it actually has these chunk IDs. It comes back, as you can see, as JSON here. And you can see there's our original text, but it's now been chunked up as well. Once we've got small chunks of text, we're sort of back to this previous model. I can now go and convert all those two things to embeddings. Is it done? Yep, I run that. Oh. So now what it's done is it's taken each of those chunks of text and associated a vector embedding with it as well. And then once I've done that, I can then effectively, if I want to, go grab all those chunks and all those vector embeddings and create a table called Trivia Chunked, which now looks pretty much the same as, do I don't describe it yet? looks pretty much the same as our original example, i.e. we have our primary key, we have an embed ID, so we have multiple now rows in here, each one for each particular chunk of text, and each chunk of text now has a vector as well. And we're back to the same example that we've taken a single PDF, extracted the text, split up the text into small chunks, and now we've got vector embeddings on each of those chunks, so we can do ad hoc search, not just on a single PDF, but inside a PDF or other particular um, unstructured documents. So pretty cool. Let's go back to our slides. Does it work with DocX? Um, yes, it does. That's my understanding. Um, I haven't actually tested it in this particular demo, um, but I've Pretty sure I've seen a blog post where someone's using DocX as well. Um, caveat on that, if someone's done things like password protection, et cetera, et cetera, then obviously that's not going to work. So hopefully that gets you excited about vectors. Even if you don't go into all the AI stuff, the ability to have a search facility now, which sort of understands what the person is meaning to say, as opposed to just doing simple text, I think that's an absolute game changer for search because let's face it, you know, the amount of times you use Google search because you want to get sort of a, a rough meaning of something as opposed to an exact word search. In fact, probably the most common thing people see on databases nowadays is customers say, they say, why can't the database, why can't the database be just like Google? Well, this gets us well along that way. Okay. Well, that burnt up a lot of time, didn't it? That's not good. Okay. Number two, this one won't take too long, hopefully. The Cloud World Demo. Uh, this was someone posted me, sent me a, a message on, on Twitter straight after my presentation at Cloud World. They said, thanks for the 23AI 100% demo session at Cloud World. Thank you for passing that on. And please don't be insulted, but I was more interested in how you got the menu system to work in SQL CL as opposed to the demos themselves. How was it done? Now, if you weren't fortunate enough to be at Cloud World, uh, just to explain what my demo was, it was just running SQL Plus like most of the demos we do here in Office Hours. But in, just in SQL Plus, what I was doing was I had a menu of demos that we could run and we would let people choose. So rather than me, you know, in, sort of push upon people what demos I wanted to give them, um, I chose a few, but I let people choose them as well. And so in SQL Plus, this menu would come up and if we ran, you know, we chose one, I think I, let's say I chose a number 11 or 13 first, then I'd run the demo that would launch a different script, run the demo like we do here on these sessions. And then when we came back to the menu, it would tick it off and say, yep, we've done number 13. And then someone might say, oh, let's do number 11. And so I do number 11, then we came back to the menu and it's number 11 ticked off. So slowly but surely we went through them and all this was running in SQL Plus. And someone said, how'd you do that? Like obviously SQL Plus or SQL CL isn't really designed to do menus and, and track changes, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought I'd show you. But as I said, yeah, I'm a command line dinosaur. So never underestimate the power um, of SQL Plus and SQL CL. So let's show you how it worked. So um, this is what I did. First thing I'll do is I'll print out, I, I ran this thing called launch.sql in my demo. And what launch.sql did this, it connected as a user. So I'm just printing it out here. Um, that just clears the screen. That's just a script I have. So it turned term out off so no one could see this stuff being done. But this is the preparatory work. I created the table, which just has a TLOB in it. And I put the entire menu into the TLOB. So this primes our demo. So we have this uh, opening thing of all the 50 or the 60 or so demos that we had that we had available to us. And they're all marked as not being ticked, no asterisks next. And that's the, the starting point. And at the end of that script, that same script, that launch script, I then just called this thing called menu and just continue to call menu all the time. The reason I have to do it this way in SQL plus, if script one calls script two, and you think, oh, well, at the end of script two, I don't want to go back to script one. I'll just do at script one. And you just keep nesting like that. There's a 20 levels deep nesting limit. 
and obviously I had more than 20 demos. So what I had to do is I always had to come back to the outer script, this launch script, and then call my menu every single time. So I only had a one level deep nesting. So be aware of that, you can only nest 20 levels deep in SQL Plus and SQL CL. So what is my menu script if we look at it? So this is what it does, we'll talk about it and then we'll run through it um, piece by piece to see what happens. So the first thing is we connect, and then I've got a few things. I turn on echo off and turn define on and clear the screen. So none of this stuff you can see. I def declare a clob. That's going to hold my menu. And here's the key things, these undefines. Which I'm just making sure that none of these substitution variables exist. First thing it is, I go get the clob. So that is the menu and I print it out. So when I print that out, basically we print out the menu. Then I ask who's going to, what demo you want to run. And here's where the little magic happens. If you're not familiar with SQL Plus, this new value thing says when I get a column result which has an alias of ZZX1, which is going to be this thing here, store the result in a substitution variable called ZZY1. I simply chose ZZs and stuff because I could not remember for the life of me how many other variables I was using throughout my 60 demos. So I wanted to choose random names so they're unlikely to be overwritten. And then what I did was I used this simple query based on someone's input to work out what script I was going to run and what menu option I needed to tick off. And at the end of it, I would simply update my clob and say, change the script number with a bracket to a script number with a bracket and an asterisk. So that's a quick walkthrough of how it does. Let's now walk through it in real life. Um, I've put pauses and I've left the echo on here so you can see it running. Normally all this would run invisibly. So you, you just ask for the prompt and off we run the script. So we turn SQL off, we turn define on, we clear the screen, and then I would run these things. I'd undefine those variables, go get the clob into the uh, variable there and print it out. So normally in the, in the real demo, none of this was seen. You simply started with the menu saying, there you go, what would you like to see? And then we ask someone what their option would be. So let's say I chose option say 30 for audit. This is the script that would run. I'd define a couple of variables for new values and I run this. So what it would do is it say, okay, this is the script I'm about to run, SH30. I'm not going to run it in tonight because I'm not going to do an audit demo. But now I know what script I need to run. And I know that when I finish that script, come back and tick menu entry number 30 as being done. So you can see here, I didn't actually run the script, but I would have run SH30, my you know, um, SQL plus 30. And then I come back and update the clob and change the 30 in a bracket to a 30 bracket and a star. And I finished the menu script. That takes me back to that initial launch script, which simply runs the menu script once more. Right, it comes back and off we go. And we go through the exact same thing again. And you can see now by the time I get to the second time I run it, I've ticked off the audit thing. That's how it works. So that's how that demo worked. Let's do some chat. <laughs> Just saying, what's happened to 44-50, etc.? Um, the reason there's some gaps in here is I recently had a complete set of, of demos and for cloud world there were certain ones i thought i don't want i i, I don't think there's worthwhile showing them um, they weren't really worth the show in fact even this is a bit of a lie i actually ran through these five here in cloud world in one single script just really really rapid fire because most people have seen those five already in many many blog posts dem demos videos etc so um yeah i took some things out because i thought i didn't want people to choose them because then i'd be forced to run them and i don't think they were worth talking about um i thought these ones are more important and and you know Sadly, we didn't get through all, all of them anyway, um, but that's what we did. So, yeah, so, um, yeah now I'm going to have to, I think, cancel this because I, I can't remember how many I put in there for the demo. Let's get out of here and then we'll rerun SQL Plus. Anyway, that's how it was run. Um, so feel free. Um, I'll put them those scripts probably on my GitHub repo at some stage soon uh, once the jet lag wears off. But yeah, feel free to uh, use that and, and use that model um, in terms of coming up with ways of, of having nice interactive scripts for demos in SQL CL or SQL Plus. Partitioned table got massive. Here's the question that came in. We have a table with a few lob columns and its size was getting large, so we decided to partition it. That's always a good plan as things get bigger, make them into smaller chunks. As a result, it is now using nearly five times the original space. Is this something we should expect with partition tables? And the answer to that is no, but it's important to understand how partition tables allocate space, plus a few little um, you know, idiosyncrasies that you might not be aware of. So let's do a little demo to show you where that comes in. He meant saying uh, he noticed that it was 26 AI. Um, yeah, if, if, in case you're wondering what version 26 of the database is, 
Uh, what we generally do, I'm using a, a next cut of the database. So 23.6 or whatever, what, I think we've, we're up to 23.6 now. So 23.7, or in fact, future version of the database, just get, they're just being cut as 26. And when we you know, finish off the beta, when we you know, get it a little bit more ready for production, uh, it will become a genuine version number. Um, so yeah, so uh, don't panic. There, there, you will never see a version 26 of the database. It's just some future version that we use while we're cutting through um, beta versions of the product that customers never see. I'm just lucky because I get to use them the latest and greatest. Where were we? Oh yes, understanding space allocation. So when it comes to partition tables, things are slightly different. Let's have a look. So I'm going to create a scenario here similar to the customer, which is we have an unpartitioned table and we're going to see what happens when we partition it in terms of its space allocation. So I'm going to create a table here called T. It's got a single column called key, which is just 99 in all cases. I'll explain what this is with that shortly. And it's a copy of scott.amp, so it's got 14 rows. 14 rows, as you can imagine, is very, very small. And the size of my table is 64K. That's the smallest extent size we allocate when you simply create a table. So we used up 64K. We've obviously used very little of that, but 64K is the size of the table. Let me now take that existing table and partition it. And the reason I created a column called key with a simple value of 99 is I can partition it by list on that value to guarantee I only get one partition. So we can actually see there's a single partition in this table which has the contents of scott.emp, the partition's called P1, so it should be basically 64K. It's literally the same table just now stored in a partition as opposed to a standalone table. And as you can see, it is eight megabytes in size. We'll come back to why it's eight megabytes in size shortly, but that obviously is the first cause of, of uh, consternation. Simply taking the exact same data, a single segment of 64K, putting it as a partition as opposed to a normal segment, and it's eight megabytes in size. We'll see why shortly. So let me drop this. Let's now make it a bit more realistic, closer to the customer's scenario, which is, I'm going to create a table called T. It's got a couple of integers, a couple of clobs, and a blob. They didn't exactly say how many, but we've got a, a few um, lobs in there, plus some normal columns. And I'll insert, effectively, some couple of integers and some typically sized clobs. So 4,000 bytes for the clob, 4,000 bytes for the clob, and 4,000... Um, well, actually, this will be 2,000 because it's each uh, pair of hex numbers equals one, so it's actually 2,000 um, bytes for the blob. And we've only got 20 rows. So once again, each row is a lot bigger now, but there's only 20 of them. If I look at that, to work out how big this table is now, I have to dig a bit deeper because I've got a segment for the actual table called T, but I've got lob segments for the actual lob storage, and I've got lob storage for the lob indexes. But if I add all those up, I get four megabytes for this table, which seems about you know right. Um, that's what we're using, chat line. Um, and man, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by from 11.202 was a surprise upgrading to 11.2. Um, yeah, feel free to add more to the chat. I'm not entirely sure what you, what you, what, what, what your intention is there, but feel free to uh, elucidate um, and we'll get back to it. So as you can see, my table T, which now has a few lobs in it, is four megabytes in size. Let's say that's, you know, we can scale it out to a much larger size. Let's assume it's getting very, very big and we want to partition it. So what I'll do is, where's that four megabyte came from first? It says, well, here's where it was. So the four megabytes was actually a 132K for the table, that a me three megabytes for the lob segments and 64K for the lob indexes. Add all that up and you get four megabytes. But you can see now that a table which has lobs in it has multiple segments stored in the database. Let's now do what I did before, which is I'm simply saying, let's take our table called T, which had 20 distinct values for C1. So I'm gonna get 20 partitions here and I'm gonna do automatic list partitioning. So it automatically creates partitions for me, just like interval partitioning for ranges. And it's just a straight copy of the table called T, which as we saw is four megabytes in size. And what do we get? The table is now 650 megabytes in size. That is somewhat alarming. That's a very, very extreme uh, growth in size. What is going on? So let's go look at effectively, once again, just like before, all the individual segments that were created as part of this table. 
And you can see we've got a lot of indexes, a lot of lob segments, a lot of lob indexes, etc. We have 20 partitions for the table. We have, therefore, we have 20 table segments. We have 20 partition, sorry, 20 lob partition segments and 20 lob index partition segments. And like we saw in the very simple demo, every single one of them for the lob is eight megabytes in size. Some of them are even larger, 16 megabytes in size. And some of the lob indexes are 64K in size, but the table itself is eight megabytes in size as well. And you can see that's obviously a massive jump. In this case, it was what, 150 times larger. So what is going on? So we, to do that, we need to dig into the database dictionary a little bit and let's connect to SysDBA and look at some of the hidden parameters that sit around inside the database. And these are the two ones of note. Partition large extents, index partition large extents. And this one defaults to true, this one defaults to false. As you can expect, when you have a partitioned table, the general consensus is you would partition something because it's getting large. You're expecting it to be a very large object. That's the motivation typically for partitioning. As a result, we make the assumption that it's unlikely that you want to have a smattering of 64K extents like you normally have with a table, and then you jump up in size. If you're unfamiliar with a normal table, we allocate you a chunk of 64K extents. When you've used 16 of those, we go to one megabyte extents. When you've used, I think, oh, what is it? A batch of those, maybe, a, a, I, don't know, I can't remember how many, maybe 32. We then go to eight megabyte extents, and then we go to 64 megabyte extents, etc. The extent sizes get larger as your table gets more and more rows in it. For partition tables, we say, well, by definition, by definition, partition tables are going to be huge. Why bother with these little 64K extents? Because we know there's going to be a lot of data in there. So what we do is we say, let's start with eight. And so you start getting these interesting scenarios where if I have a lot of partitions, but not necessarily a lot of data in those partitions, we don't care. We're allocating eight megabyte partitions no matter what because of this setting here, partition large extents true. One thing that's interesting, if you're doing some playing around with Oracle Database Free, which has those 12 gigabyte limits, you've got to be careful when you use partition tables because you're going to chew up eight megabytes every single time, even if you're just doing playthings. So what you can do, let's go back to the slides, is, as I said, we assume big and dense, but what you can do is, as long as you log an SR with support to get their blessing, you can tweak those parameters to both be false, which means even if it's our partition table, we'll still start with our 16, 64K extents and then go to one mega extents and then go to eight mega extents and then 64s, etc. It's unlikely to be an issue. This particular person saw it, this particular customer saw it because they had a lot of lobs. So what that meant is every single lob in their table gets its own segment and every single partition gets its own lob segment as well. So what you have is you get 100 partitions times say five lobs on the table, you're by definition gonna get at least another 500 partitions. Each at a very minimum will be eight megabytes in size. So just be aware of that, that every partition by default is always eight megabytes in size because we assume you're gonna be putting a whole stack of data in there, but you can tweak it down, but please get the blessing of Oracle support first because it's an underscore parameter. And generally, if you set them without the blessing of Oracle support, you can get into grief when it comes to getting uh, support uh, in future. So be aware of that. But yeah, you can actually have small partition tables. Just be aware of setting that parameter if you need to. 9.45. I've been rambling on. I'm not, not getting it through our questions, but this one's a little bit fast. Won't take long. It's just more of a, a warning, um, something I stumbled upon, and we had a few customers um, raise some alarm about as well. As long as you know it, you'll be good to go. Apex, export, and import. This is a question that came in through Ask Tom, actually. I exported and imported my app in Apex 24.1, the latest and greatest release, and I no longer have the metadata about which developers have been working on the app. Is this a bug? And to show what happens is, if you're unfamiliar with Apex, typically when you log into Apex and start working on an app that you've already had, oh, here we go, something in the chat. Judith is saying undocumented parameters should be documented. Well, Judith, you and I will just have to disagree on that one. Um, but yeah, so there's a reason they're undocumented. Um, but yeah, you could argue that maybe it should become, yeah, you should remove the underscore, but most underscore parameters are underscore for a reason. Where were we? Okay, yep. 
if you bring up an app that you've been working on in Apex and you might have a team of people working on it, if you go to the, the front page for that app, you get the list of all the front page. That's a bad choice. If you go to the, uh, the root directory for that app in Apex, then what you get is a list of all the pages that people have been working on. And you can see it's got, you know, this is, actually, I think, Ask Tom, the Ask Tom app. It's got who's been working on it, Eli Feuerstein, that's um, Stephen Feuerstein's son, if you don't know, uh, myself. You know, we haven't worked on this for a while, but you can see what the last time we worked on it, who was working on it. A lot of people, especially small scale, small scale arrow, let's try that again. A lot of uh, people, especially small scale Apex shops, effectively use this almost like source control. That, you know, oh, you know, I need to do some work on page one. Oh, yeah, Connor was working on that. He hasn't worked on it for a while. I'm good to go. It's useful metadata to have. I then go export it, and this is in Apex 24.1. I go export the app in the normal way, and then I import it, and this is what you see. And this is the first time you've seen this. You won't see it in Apex 23 and below, but you will see it in Apex 24. That information has been wiped. It's gone. Now, the question is, why would we do this? Well, there's some very sound reasons for doing it, and I'll give you two. The first one is, is we wanted to make this a bit more of a consistent experience. Now, what do I mean by that is, as you can see, for every single page, we've got this metadata. But if you've ever used Apex, that metadata you'll know is stored everywhere. For almost for every single item you change, any single region, etc., almost anything you change in Apex has this metadata attached to it, which is a good thing. You can always go at the very low level and say, oh, yes, you know, John changed this thing three days ago. When we exported, we only ever exported this root level data, effectively the updated information for just once for each page. The lower level stuff we simply dropped off anyway. So a lot of people were assuming that just because they saw the metadata at the page level that we were dragging all the metadata with the exports. And when they saw that they'd lost the, you know, the lower level stuff, then obviously that created some confusion. So we didn't want to sort of say, well, okay, let's just you know, continue with the status quo. We wanted to either pick up all the data or have none. That's, a, I think, a more consistent experience. The second reason is in you know, Apex, is now obviously probably one of Oracle's probably most core application development frameworks. You know, the days of just a few thousand Apex apps, apps out there are long gone. Now there are literally hundreds of thousands of enterprise Apex apps floating around the world. And the reality is there's a lot more as, as a result vendors as well, people who are building Apex applications and giving them and selling them to customers. What you probably don't wanna do is, for example, have information like your developer's email addresses in here, which are now going out to random customers who then see this information. Or you might, I hate to say it, you may have told a customer you've been actively working on this application and the metadata says, well, you haven't touched it in a year. Yeah, you know, these are the kind of information that you might want to, might not want to pass on to people who are third parties. So we decided the safest way is to strip it off. Now, if you want to preserve that behavior, we've actually changed, we've added, added a new parameter to the Apex export option. Down here, in Apex 24.1, and it's included in the release notes, you have this order information. What do you want? By default, it's null. Null. God, <laughs> the jet lag is hitting. By default, it's none, which means we strip the order information off. It's all gone. When you import it in, it's gone. So be aware, that's the default. If you choose names and dates, it's not the old behavior. It's not just the names and dates on the basic page level. It's everything. So it's all the names, all the dates on every single place we currently store it. As I said, we wanted to avoid that sort of confusion and inconsistency. If you want order information, we give it to you for everything now, not just that root level stuff. Or you can choose just dates. Maybe it's just names you're worried about, you wanna strip them up, but you're happy to have the dates. But key thing is it defaults to none. So it is a distinct change in behavior from Apex 23 and below. It now definitely is effectively um, by default to none. So the reason I wanted to stress that is, We've had customers go, it's gone. And we say, oh, well, go back to your previous version in source code control. And they go, what do you mean source code control? So be aware, you need to be careful if you're using Apex and it's your only you know, piece of, of metadata, your only copy of the source, I, I can't stress enough. Uh, you're gonna lose that data if you do export and import without knowing these uh, implications. So it is better. I think it's a better approach. It's more consistent, but you really need to take care if you are relying on that information for you know, critical decisions because it's going to get wiped unless you're careful. But overriding that is, you know, please, you know, Apex isn't a source code control system. 
you're meant to use source code control, which tracks who does what changes, you know, all that normal stuff. Apex is a development tool, use a source code control system, and then you won't really care. But uh, I think in Apex 24.2, the next release, um, I think we're making some change to that functionality such that if you export with the names or the dates, then that setting will be remembered. So from, from that point onwards, that application will remember that setting. Um, so as long as you remember the first time, you'll be good to go. Chat line. Ah, yeah, Jeff has added an important point on the, um, on the chat line as well. That is, if you strip off that metadata, when you're trying to do, for example, diffs between, say, version one of your application and version two, what have I changed? I might be you know, seeing, you know, maybe on a merge conflict, et cetera, then what you don't want to do is have all those random dates and random usernames in there uh, creating false merge differences. So that's another reason to do it. Thanks, Jeff. Um, one thing that's important is the current version of SQL CL is unaware of that new parameter. So if you're just using the Apex command, uh, to export an application in SQL CL, it will pick up the default because you can't pass that parameter and therefore it will strip it all off. Um, in the next version of SQL CL, we'll have a facility where you can actually pass that parameter as well. But be aware, just using the Apex export command in SQL CL will effectively default the audit information to none for the time being. 9.52, I reckon we can maybe squeeze one more in. 23AI Parallel. We are exploring 23AI on Autonomous, and we've noticed that a lot more operations are occurring in parallel. This is surprising because we're using Autonomous Free, which is a single CPU. The concept parallel doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. What is the cause? Uh, what we've done is we've introduced, what I say, less restrictions in 23AI. And what I mean less restrictions is we do our best now to um, respect the service levels that you're connecting to. And the best way of describing that is to talk about effectively um, the, the various, um, what are they called? Oh, the various consumer groups. Yes, let me, let me, let me try again. Man, it's, bad. It's, a bad, it's a bad evening. What we try to do is we respect the consumer group, aka service that you've connected to, and because you connect to the high service, which in the documentation says we'll use parallelism, then we respect that as opposed to now making decisions like we used to in terms of the number of CPUs we have. Let me do a demo. Um, these are both connecting to autonomous. They'll be a bit slow because these autonomous databases are around the world. But I'm connecting here to obviously Oracle Database 19. This is my autonomous database running 19C. You can see I've connected to the high consumer group, which means I want to use parallel all the time, but this autonomous database only has one CPU. I'll drop a table, create a table. Let me do an explain plan for an insert values. Insert values by definition is never parallel. And you can see the explain plan says that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just doing load table conventional. However, insert select can be parallelized and I've connected to the high service, which means I wanna use parallel. If I look at this, it says, nope, I'm using parallel one. And the rationale is sensible here. Right, I'm using parallel one because there was no expensive parallel operation because I'm doing an insert into table select one from dual. I'm inserting one row. That's hardly expensive. So that's why I did it. You know, there was actually no need to do it. Let's now do the exact same demo on a 23AI autonomous just to show the subtle change in behavior. So this is now 23.6. This is an autonomous database running out of Frankfurt. I'm connected to the high service as before. As the docs say, I want to use parallel. What we've done is we're now respecting the docs and respecting your connection. So once again, create a table, insert values one, that's a non-parallel operation, it's non-parallel. However, insert select can be parallelized. What we've changed now is we don't do this additional cost check, this thing of, oh yes, you've only got one CPU, it's a very simple query, we don't need to do parallel. We're saying, look, you connected as high. You said, when I connect as high, I want to use parallel. We're going to do it. So even though this is just a single row insert, we're going to do it in parallel because we're now being a bit more consistent with how we respect your connection to consumer groups. So something to be aware of is that now is if you're connecting to medium or high, 
we are going to use parallel whenever we can because that was the definition of those services initially. We're not going to do that check in terms of costing to actually lower the parallelism to maybe one uh, just because it didn't seem to be an expensive operation. That's probably the best way of describing it. High and medium services is not just the case of being a faster version of low. High and medium were never just add more CPUs. They change the way things run. Things that might have run as a normal conventional insert will now run as a direct mode insert because they'll be forced to parallel. That was always the case in all versions of autonomous services, but now with 23AR, you'll notice them more because now we will always do them in parallel if you're on the medium and high services, as long as there are resources available. We're not gonna do any additional costing. And on that note, uh, we had some obviously some more stuff to do, but we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks for your time. Um, apologies for all my stuttering and stumbling or whatever. Um, obviously, I, I just need a little bit more sleep um, and the energy levels are probably not so high. Um, not that I want to leave you on a, a, a damp note, but uh, one of the other reasons the um, uh, energy levels are not so high is um, unfortunately my sister passed away uh, earlier this week. Um, and I'm not trying to be a damper. I actually wanted to thank you guys because one of the best things I could do uh, this week was to jump on board with a whole bunch of community people, uh, like-minded people. So having you all here um, you know, has made my day a little bit better. So I wanted to thank you very much for that. Uh, there probably won't be an office hours next month because I'll be, as you saw from the earlier slides, I'll be all over Europe. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you had some value out of this session. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to have you on the call. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon on another Office Hours, uh, hopefully in November. Bye for now, everybody.